is crucial because Pixar cannot claim to be a conscientious author without accepting liability for the consequences of his actions, even those actions that may prove that the corporation has no real conscience at all. but they were largely due to merchandise and not the general house. So they were losing their prestige. Hercules, for example, would be an example. But, but the, what, what Pixar understood was the importance of making animation animation. And, and computer animation gave them an ability to do that technological uh, advantage that was just not there before. The reason Disney uh, the animation looks so lousy uh, in the 90s, 80s, 90s, it's dumb old. Uh, <laughs> was because they, because it, it, as they got larger, they shifted to the detail division of labor, the detail division of labor required the animate the decision to be made. The animators get to animate the character throughout the whole movie, or do they get to animate the character in this particular scene, the part of the scene. They chose, of course, the latter. Uh, it, it was a choice probably efficient, but it was a choice that meant that you had different styles of different scenes. So you had to find a way of making those, standardizing those. And the only way you could do that was by getting live actors. So you, so they did some of that in Snow White, but by the time they got to uh, Cinderella, the post-war uh, animation movies uh, from Cinderella onward, compared to Cinderella and Snow White, is that they, that all of the, that they, they shifted to the two-track uh, narrative where they had they had uh, real animated uh, animals who had real distinct <laughs> characters and then they had another track which were flat pe people who were recognizable as animated versions of, of, of human beings but who didn't really even uh, connect to the other narrative. And that increased so that, so that Walt had a double was it well put the studio in a double bind? One, he wanted to be a director of live action movies, and number two, he had infected the live, uh, he infect, infected the uh, cartoons with live action because he wanted to save money that he could use to make the live action movies. <laughs> so, so, so the point I take it is that is that as in genre. Like, how do you make a new genre? When, when do you have a new genre? I mean, people, I'm sure, have deeper thoughts on this than I do. But, but in, 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 in motion picture, the, the most punctual example of this is Frankenstein. And, and Frankenstein is, a, a, is, as a word, a, a, a performative genre, uh, unlike almost any other. And the performance is 
speciation. You make a new species. How do you make a new species? Well, it's like a punctuated equilibrium. And and in, in that sense, what 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 a Pixar is doing is speciation. That is, is creating toys as a different kind of as, as a different kind of figure for finding an area uh, between a degraded form of animation and let's call it live action, which is increasingly being subject to similar kind of degradation from different technologies, which are hybridizing and uh, and in effect. Uh, Hybrid, live action, CGI, and the rest. There's a Pixar takes a, a territory of purity in regard to that. This is all CGI. We're, and 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 the and the and I think there's an odd statement. I really there's an odd statement of humanism in this particular strategy of animation, which is to say you're not getting human beings in either other the other. Of the other kind. What would it be like to have human beings? It wouldn't be like human beings because they can they have flesh and they can, they can there's no there's no standard for human beings in motion pictures anymore. There's no standard uh, I, I don't know. I guess you can accept accept uh, some uh, but you can but but it's the social modality of the relationship, uh, the social, I don't even know, social, the social association of this, uh, of, uh, of, of these characters that make it possible to make a Wally as, as, as really coming from the same leaf as the human beings that have fattened up in the, in the, in the um, spaceship. So, so, so in that sense, the ability to com com to create a world that appears closed but is but is multi is multiety in unity. To go back to my uh, uh, origin argot is to, is is one of as I think uh, uh, an overriding strategy for uh, Pixar, although maybe not last year. That's a long answer. Does that have bear on anything that you well yes. no. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the answer I That's fine. Oh well tell me the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to repeat it. No, I, I don't think it's a good idea. Okay. <laughs> yes. I, I have two questions. Um, and the first one is to what degree is the culture of Pixar cultural studies? And so you kind of mentioned about the kind of play that the toys can have when they kind of individuate themselves from the mass narrative, which seems to have a kind of tactility and a kind of cultural studies, reception studies, like the toys are, rece are remaking themselves as they're perceived. Um, and so what do the politics of that view or the corporate conscious of that mean and the culture of Pixar as cultural studies? And the second question is, and I don't know if this is in some longer version, it seems like you'd be able to do a lot with Toy Story 3 for, for your um, for your reading, because in Toy Story 3, the toys are, are left by Andy, or banned by Andy, or lost by Andy. There's a lot of different permutations of that story. And they go to the depersonalized, uh, bigger toy bin of the preschool, <coughs> and it's about the group trying to stay together in spite of the outside pressures of the evil toys, uh, which would seem to try to maintain the, the, cult, the culture of Pixar themselves in light of the bigger body that they've now been absorbed into, and in fact they remake the preschool into a much more humane environment by disposing of the evil teddy bear. Um, so that was, I'm sorry, the toys are not destroyed. Um, so I mean that would seem to lend itself quite nicely, and maybe a third point would be what about the children if we're worried about intention, because I don't think kids care about the inner workings of Pixar, um, and so what, is, what are they responsible for if they have liability? What are we teaching oh, the children? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and the children, by the way, who are deadly to the toys. Well, I think that the, the issue the issue of viability in some sense is a is a, it's hypothetical insofar as it hasn't been tested. But one of the reasons one of the reasons why Toy Story three I wouldn't want to necessarily go that direction with Toy Story three is because the prop the, the, the fundamental 
the real problem here and the real world problem is not a problem of children, it's a problem of unions. And <laughs> the fact that, that we, and um, the, uh, another way of saying this is that they, they really weren't integrated at the beginning. They really were two different companies. And, and what made it possible for them to join and work together uh, under the second contract that Jobs uh, agreed to, and the last that he agreed to with Eisner, was co-branding. Not, not a single brand, but they each had their brand, so you could identify where, where Disney came from and Pixar came from. But the reason for that was not simply uh, 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 a, a form of uh, proprietary uh, uh, control or pride. It was also a function of the problems involving the, the workforce. Uh, Pixar was not a unionized company. Disney was, is a unionized company. And so that the, the issues of getting along are very serious ones indeed. And, and, and Pixar, in that sense, is you know, more traditional, more Disney than Disney, because uh, that's what we're all tell about. <coughs> that's what